Well, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to uh, this celebration of faculty careers for Jan Olick. This is one of many in a series that we're having. Uh, it's part of our post-tenure review process that's occurring within the College of Engineering. And maybe I should mention just a little bit of background on that. And maybe before I do that, but I, I'm so comfortable with this audience because I know you all for the most part, but uh, I'm Robert Frosch. I'm Associate Dean of Engineering for Resource Planning and Management. So I'd like to welcome you here on behalf of the College of Engineering. Uh, again, talking a little bit about post-tenure tenure review is a process that the College of Engineering initiated several years ago. And so for senior faculty, faculty that have been promoted for past seven years, past their promotion, we're regularly doing these uh, review uh, seminars as a celebration of the progress that Jan has made over his career. So he'll tell us a little bit about what he has done uh, in his recent past, as well as kind of the history of what he's been doing. But then it's also charting the course for the future, not just where we're stopping and celebrating today, but celebrating what his future successes will be and how he'll move off into the future. So past this process of having this seminar, uh, Jan will also be meeting with the head of uh, the school, uh, GS, and he'll also be meeting with Leah as the dean that, that talk about uh, kind of his future plans and where he's headed with that. So a little bit, of, that was just a little bit about the background of uh, this symposium. The other uh, thing I want to do is obviously introduce Jan. Uh, Jan's been a colleague of mine now since I started here. He was here slightly before. <laughs> I started here in 97 and I was looking back in here, it was 1994. So I knew you had just started a little bit yeah. when I first started back here in 97. And actually, when I first met Jan was before that, turns out I was a student at University of Texas Austin because Jan has some connections to UT. Jan did his uh, master's degree there in structural engineering. And before, he actually has another master's in uh, air airports pavements, right, from Krakow University mm -hmm. in Poland. So again, I had a connection at UT, but I was at, I think it was Salt Lake City, ACI, and I think that was where I first mm -hmm. met Jan. And he was at Penn State at the time as, as a faculty member. So I've known Jan actually for quite a few years. And since being at Purdue, we've actually collaborated on a number of projects, mm -hmm. both uh, research related as well as actually some consulting that we've had to do for helping out the Indiana Department of Transportation. So uh, I consider Jan a, a good friend. And so I've known Jan again for, for many years. And we also love concrete. We're both in the concrete area. <laughs> and uh, we devote a lot of time to ACI, and so we always Besides being here on campus, we get to see each other at conventions, and we'll be in about a week or so in Milwaukee. Head off to Milwaukee. So, uh, without further ado, I really uh, want to, you know, celebrate Jan's faculty career. He's been again with us for over 20 years now. Uh, Jan, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Robert. I Did think I'm. Mic, so I you... think I'm mic'd, so uh, I should be hopefully recordable, and I hope you can hear me without the mic. The Zoom is not that big. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to share with you what I've been doing for, let's say, 20 plus years, OK? And uh, we'll uh, see what directions I, I have in mind as far as the future uh, uh, remaining years uh, of my career. A little bit about myself, for those of you who don't know uh, exactly where I come from. Robert already uh, introduced me, mentioned that I uh, came from Poland. I was born in the city of Krakow, and that's where I uh, went to school. And I got my first two degrees there, Bachelor's of Science and Master of Science in Civil Engineering uh, in what is called Krakow University of Technology. And uh, in uh, 1982, I guess it was, I got a Fulbright scholarship uh, to study in the US. And I came to University of Texas at Austin, about 6,000 miles from home, and spent about two years there. I got a master's degree there in structural engineering. And I really like working with materials and applications to uh, infrastructural uh, components. And I was talking to my advisor, Dr. Karaskirio, at the time, and I said, you know, what would you recommend for a good materials program? And he says, Purdue University. And uh, I said, well, where is Purdue? And he didn't know exactly, <laughs> 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 which was a little bit alarming. <laughs> but we 
took the atlas out. That was before the internet, and uh, we figured out it's in Indiana. So I actually flew in here to uh, scope the place. It was in, the, in January, mm -hmm. and it was a heavy winter. And coming from Austin, it was a shock. Small town, completely covered in snow. The small airplane landed at Purdue Airport, and I barely could see the road. Uh, but anyway, uh, the program was good, so I decided to come. So I got uh, to Purdue uh, to work on my PhD. I got here in 85, graduated in 87. And uh, for the uh, next few years, I was kind of wandering all over the US. I got my first faculty position uh, at the Colorado School of Mines. So I spent about three years there. And when I was there, I got a phone call from Penn State. And they uh, said, well, you are at the program that really doesn't have a big research component, which was true. Uh, the, there were departments at the Colorado School of Mines that were very much research oriented, but the Department of Engineering, or Division of Engineering, as it was called, it was not. There were three young faculties there that we were trying to uh, put together, uh, together a graduate program. We didn't have a graduate program. So it was difficult to compete with all the uh, well-established program for tenure and promotion if you didn't have graduate students and, and didn't have a research. So I took the opportunity and moved to Penn State. And uh, when I was there, I got an offer or invitation to uh, come back to Purdue. I obviously knew the place, and I very much liked the uh, faculty members who were here, and the labs were fantastic, and uh, I decided to come back. So that was back in 1994, and I didn't move yet. Okay. <laughs> well, it seems like everybody seems to be moving around. Anyway. Uh, what do I do? Uh, I kind of like to think that I work in the area of durability and sustainability. And uh, the reason uh, I work on that is because of in it's of interest to me, but it's sort of an underlying theme of what's happening in the cement and concrete industry. So over the years, certainly during my career, there's this growing interest in uh, focusing on durability and sustainability. And that has various forms. Uh, anything from uh, usage of secondary fuels in cement production, uh, and this is mostly to incinerate some waste from other industries. Uh, uh, in increased usage of industrial byproducts such as fly ash, silica fuel, metacholine, slag, and so forth. Uh, new admixtures are coming on the market, seems like almost every month. And the current concrete mixture design uh, is rather complex because of those admixtures. There's potential for incompatibilities from time to time. So it makes uh, professional life rather interesting. Uh, probably the most important one in this category is really increasing demand for longer life of the structure, especially when we are facing a, a, a staggering bills for fixing the infrastructure, the question naturally comes up, well, can we do it better? Can we do it in a more reliable way? And uh, I said, well, you know, this is really a good field to be in because what I am interested in is looking at the microstructural level and at the chemistry of the system. And I know it's pretty critical to making sure that the big elements work. So the title of my talk was Durability and Sustainability. Why is it that the small or little things matter? And they matter because of the microstructure and chemistry that is involved that actually dictates the behavior of the element itself. There's also issue of scale. I mean, we are talking about market that is very, very large. Uh, in 2014, you can see that the world's cement production was about 4.1 billion tons. That corresponds roughly to about 10 billion cubic meters of concrete. We assume about uh, you know, 400 kilograms per 
uh, of cement per cubic meter, but associated with that tremendous production of cement is the release of CO2, a greenhouse gas, roughly about one ton of CO2 per ton of cement. So the cement industry produces about four billion tons of CO2, which everybody is worrying about recently, right? On the grand scale, it's really not that much. Uh, it's about five to eight percent of global CO2. The other industries, in, in, including automotives, produce more. But it's not negligible, right? 8% is still a pretty sizable amount. And uh, the fact that we have deteriorating infrastructure, uh, economies are predicting that's going to present some drag on the economy in the future. So it seems like right now is a good time to start worrying about those things, and more people do worry about those things. Uh, I thought being the the university is a home to the astronaut. I need to make some analogy of uh, concrete usage. If we make six in diameter concrete cylinder, which is a standard cylinder for testing, we can reach the moon four times a day. A day. That's how much concrete we are making. Right? It's 230,000 miles to the moon. So imagine four cylinders, six inch in diameter, that, that tall. So there is, there is, a, there is a lot of uh, uh, money at stake. There is a lot of infrastructural components that are affected by what's happening. So this is supposed to be about my research interest. So my research area are really traditional and novel supplementary cementitious materials. And to a small extent, I work in the asphalt area. So thank you, Becky and Aisha, for coming. The, 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 they represent the black side of the, <laughs> of the civil engineering, as opposed to the white side represented by concrete. I worry about durability of concrete, performance on concrete. And all this is obviously interrelated. More specifically, what I work on is on advanced characterization techniques for cementitious materials. I worry about microstructural properties and the effect on performance. Uh, I spend a lot of time on mechanisms of deterioration, trying to understand what those are, and trying to come up with some uh, models that can provide uh, information about future performance based on what I learn about the materials from this bullet one and based on what I learned from bullets two and three. So uh, it's difficult to summarize in 50 minutes or so everything that I've done. Uh, and uh, you would be bored, I, I'm sure, uh, even though it's an exciting topic for, topic for me. But I will talk about a few items that uh, I spent probably the most time on. Uh, the issue of uh, fly ash and other supplementary materials is something that I've been working on for the last 30 years. My, my master's thesis was, uh, uh, my second master's thesis was uh, dealing with fly ash. And throughout my professional career, I've done a lot of different research projects that are related to those uh, materials. So this is the SEM image of the fly ash. This is the silica fume. You can see nice little. Uh, around spheres, and you know, those are uh, other metacolin, natural pozzolans, uh, slag, and so forth. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about fly ash, because fly ash is one of those interesting materials, uh, because it's a byproduct of uh, coal burning in the power plants. And it's being captured, and in 1980s, the, the power plant will actually pay you if you wanted to take it off their hands. Because they had to store it, and uh, they had to build a big storage pond. The you know, environmentalists were not happy with the storage, and nobody knew what to do with it. Uh, once people determined that they could be beneficially utilizing concrete and actually improve, improve the properties of concrete, uh, the companies emerged that started marketing the flyers. So they will buy the flyers from, 
from the power plant. Power plant is in the business of making power, not worrying about the fly ash. But that will be sort of an intermediary. They will buy that from them, uh, maybe do a little bit of classification or some sort of an enhancement of the properties, very minimal, and then turn around and sell it to the cement uh, producers uh, or, or to concrete producers. Uh, we typically, sorry, we typically talk about two types of fly ashes, type F and time, uh, uh, type C. Type F is what we call a low calcium fly ash. Uh, type C is a high calcium fly ash. Uh, and they are actually uh, quite interesting when it comes to how they influence the properties of concrete. Uh, class C fly ashes, for example, are not very good with respect to addressing some of the durability issues of concrete. Uh, class F, on the other hand, is very good, but it's not as, uh, you know, with respect to durability, but it's not very good with respect to reactivity. Uh, but you can see, looking at the chemical composition, that, that they have typically calcium, silica, alumina, and ferrite, some sulfate and alkalis. And you can see class C has much higher percentages of calcium than class F. But there are calcium silica aluminates. Uh, cement components are also calcium silica aluminates. The, the amount of calcium to silica, uh, the ratio of calcium to silica in the cement is very high. Uh, in fly ash it is not, but they are somewhat similar with respect to chemistry. Therefore, one would expect that they will work together uh, well in the system. Uh, morphology of the fly ashes is something that uh, people who work in the area worry about a lot because it is um, influencing the properties of concrete, especially in the first stage once you start adding it. So you can probably imagine that if you have nice little spheres, they will behave very different from something that looks like that. It has, this is the unburned coal particles that, for example, will have very negative influence on the amount of air that you can entrain in concrete. You may have a system where you have a lot of small spheres in the bigger spheres. You know, notice that the sphere looks kind of a glassy, and glass is actually a reactive component of the fly ash. Composition of the fly ash determines how effective the fly ash is going to be with respect to impairing certain properties on concrete. Uh, for class C fly ashes, uh, they, tend, uh, they tend to be cleaner. If you look at the surfaces, they are more um, uh, deposits free, if you will. And they are typically very good. They have very often a lot of fine particles. They are very good with respect to durability, uh, to workability. They also tend to be quite reactive. The glass, the type of glass that makes the sphere is uh, more reactive than the type of glass that is present in the class F. Uh, the standard thing to do if you want to know something about the reactivity of the fly ash is to determine by let's say XRD or, uh, or other technique, the amount of crystalline components and the amount of glass. The more glass you have, the more reactive the material. Uh, most of the components that are crystalline that shows, show as a peak over here uh, are uh, typically non-reactive. So you have quartz and molide, uh, those are not reactive. But what, what I wanted to uh, draw your attention to is you know, this hump here that you see, uh, that represents the amount of glass. And if you look sort of a, as, if, as the highest point or the medium of, of this hump, uh, for the class F ashes, this is located at about 25 degrees to theta angle when we do the XRD experiment. If you move to class C ash, notice that that hump is about 30 degrees. That reflects the differences in composition of the glass and therefore in reactivity. So I actually spent quite a bit of time trying to capture the differences in the chemical composition and how they influence the location of this peak and in fact the size of this peak. Because uh, fly ash is a byproduct. Nobody really controls 
the quality of that material. And if you are a user of, of that material, you would like to know whether a batch to batch to batch will provide a consistent performance. Do you need to put more or do you need to put less? And how do you quickly determine that? And for years, people were trying to link the chemical composition with mineralogical composition uh, via various models, including us. Uh, and I think the chances of doing it now is higher than ever. Because in addition to doing what we are doing here with simple XRD classification, you can also do a more involved classification or evaluation using scanning electron microscopy, where you can do on very micro level uh, the, the, the determine the distribution of various phases, uh, various chemical components, and combining those various techniques gives much better uh, prediction uh, with respect to performance of that material in, uh, in concrete. So we attempted to do that. Uh, we uh, developed quite a few models uh, that were focusing on the glass uh, content, both estimation and composition, and uh, got uh, reasonably good results. Uh, this is one example, for example, uh, uh, which shows the uh, predicted set time based on the chemistry uh, of the fly ash. Of importance to the users because class C fly ashes in particular very often uh, tend to extend the set time. And especially if the temperature drops and you have a material that, that you use uh, that has extended set time, you would like to know. Sometimes the admixtures interact with the components of the fly ash and extend that set time further. So maybe you would expect that you can come and start finishing your slab in three, week, uh, sorry, in three hours, and a day later it still didn't set. So that, that's the problem, right? So if you can predict that, that would be helpful. Uh, we use those models uh, for helping with development of performance-related specifications for both bridges and pavements. And that involves both material selection, mixture composition, durability, and performance. So I'll spend a little bit of uh, time talking about this. Uh, and this is really focusing on the durability issue. So deterioration of uh, bridge decks or pavements, especially if it's premature, uh, is, uh, is uh, of concern. The typical environmental conditions that contribute to this deterioration is anything from corrosion of reinforcement to freestyle damage to scaling, which would be the damage in the presence of the icing chemicals. Traditionally, uh, people were trying to take care of that durability issue by specifying or controlling wear cement ratio. Uh, but, and prescribing a minimum cement, cement content, which very often uh, produced the mixes that were too strong and actually created additional durability problems with respect to fatigue or uh, cracking tendency. Uh, so uh, right now, people are trying to move away from that and uh, trying to specify something else specify some performance characteristics. But how do you achieve those if you are using some of those supplementary cementitious materials? Uh, it's a remaining challenge. So I work a little bit in that area, uh, focusing on enhancing the durability of concrete. Especially when we started that work, there was very little guidance available um, how to achieve certain performance characteristics if you try to mix maybe two or three of those supplementary materials together, why would you want to mix them? Turns out there is certain synergy between various materials and what you are getting in terms of output is bigger than the sum of the two components that went in. So that's obviously beneficial. So uh, let's talk a little bit about a couple of projects. One was on developing proportioning method uh, for mixtures with predictable performance characteristics. 
identification of optimum content of the binder to achieve those t uh, performance characteristics and evaluation of mechanical properties and ultimately modeling those uh, predicted mechanical properties over time. Uh, in high performance concrete, there was a term that was hot maybe 20 years ago. Uh, now that high performance concrete is actually a regular con concrete now, uh, technology changes. But uh, majority of binder was Portland cement. People use silica fume, flash, and slags. So we thought, well, how about if we try to combine two of those in addition to cement uh, in any order? And would there be any benefit? And how can we do that? And and so forth. So uh, if you look at those variability, well, if you if you look at the amount of materials uh, that you can use, and if you look at the percentages of those materials that you can use, uh, this really presents a challenging experimental problem. You cannot do all the possible combination. That wouldn't be a smart way to do it anyway, right? So uh, you try to do uh, what we call the experimental design and select the minimum number of mixes that when you, when you make and evaluate the properties will allow you for statistically valid uh, analysis of your data and making some sort of a statistical predictions models. So one of the things that, we, that we've done, both for bridges and for pavements, that uh, we use this technique called surface response methodology to determine properties as the function of you can see water binder ratio here. You can see content of silica fume and content of fly ash. So you can see that various colors represents to various ranges. This is a total charge in coulombs. That has to do with the resistance of concrete to ingress of chloride, uh, which is one of the concerns in the durability. So if you wanted to have a really low coulomb value, uh, you want to be in this region and so forth, right? So that, that was helpful for uh, recommending certain practices or certain specifications to the DOT in terms of how to go about selecting the material. We've done similar thing uh, for uh, pavements. Uh, this involves the slag, which is another byproduct, uh, uh, and silica fume. So there's a mix that has portent cement slag and silica fume. Uh, we actually develop uh, a, a little model uh, that allows you to put the values of the expected performance characteristics. Uh, let's say you want 5,000 PSI concrete at 28 days or, or 10,000. Uh, you want uh, that value of rapid collect permeability or resistance to chloride. And that model will, for given water cement ratio, water binder ratio, will actually give you uh, the recommended uh, percentages of supplementary cementitious materials or the composition of the binary or ternary mix that you can use for that. And uh, the model is all obviously only as good as as uh, the data that you put in. Uh, we've done, as I said, statistical planning of experiment and statistical evaluation. Then the real uh, proof came uh, from actually looking at the uh, performance of the actual uh, constructed facility. So we, uh, we had several bridges. You can see them listed here, uh, where both us and INDOT were running the test to determine w that whether we agree with the values. I guess they didn't completely trust us that we <laughs> don't rig the outcome, right? And, and uh, we're looking at uh, you know, quite a number of, uh, high number of specimens. And then we're looking for verification of the model. And you can see that, uh, for example, with respect to the current that was uh, able to pass through that concrete, uh, the, the model prediction there in the uh, black lines there um, match the data pretty well. Considering that those were totally different mixes that we didn't do, didn't have any control over, 
I, I was pretty happy with that outcome because it means that the model based on combining the material characteristics and uh, evaluation of contribution from individual components to the final outcome actually worked. Uh, I mentioned that we uh, also were able to uh, account for some synergistic effects uh, between, uh, of interaction between various components uh, and we were actually able to classify or quantify the amount of this synergistic contribution uh, and if you look at the predictions, especially in 180 days, this is for example for initial absorptivity or for rapid permeability, uh, you can see that the values that were predicted and the, the actual values here were pretty close. Again, a good tool for, uh, for using um, these models and coming up with some performance characteristics that you can actually put in the specification. Uh, we developed several methods for those validations. This is an example of the predicted versus measured rapid permeability based on the maturity method, which was another model that was built up on the previous models uh, with respect to the usage of the flyers that I described earlier. Uh, about 10 years ago, maybe 15 by now, uh, all of a sudden a new problem uh, surface and there's always uh, this new, prep, new, new problem that gets us excited for about 10 years and then it kind of fades away. And so everybody was saying, oh, sky is falling, sky is falling. We have a problem with the icers. Uh, the pavements in particular uh, started showing sign of premature deterioration and everybody was blaming it, the icers uh, or the icing practices uh, that uh, reflected the need for uh, you know, better uh, methods of controlling guys and snow because of the increased traffic. So uh, the ice they were more aggressive toward concrete. And it turned out that uh, fly ash, uh, this byproduct that is being used in concrete, uh, actually protects the concrete very well. And this is a good example. This is a fly ash specimen. It has 20% fly ash. This is just regular plain concrete. And you can see the amount, of the amount of deterioration that is happening in the plain concrete with respect to the fly ash. Uh, that, that was, uh, uh, it took some convincing of DOTs that actually using a fly ash is good for that purposes. Uh, the, the problem that a uh, typical contractor wait, uh, working for DOT faces is that come October, contractor is not allowed to use the fly ash anymore because concrete with fly ash takes longer to develop strength. And they were afraid that if that concrete is salted uh, in early fall, uh, there will be damage uh, and uh, they didn't allow uh, the contractor to use fly ashes. So every October there was a big shortage of cement because everybody who was using 20, 25% of fly ash all of a sudden had to switch and they needed cement and cement was in short supply. So uh, we were trying to uh, say, listen, we can use some of those models to predict the extent to which the fly ash will actually react and be able to, uh, to actually give you some sort of assurance that with certain fly ashes, you don't actually run the risk. So initially, DOT said, OK, we will extend the deadline or the, yeah, the, the ban on using the fly ash by one month. Uh, so not, no, not October, November. But the contractor has to take the entire risk. If the payment goes bad, is a contractor's responsibility. So the contractors obviously didn't want to do it. So nothing was changing for a while until those super de-icers came on the scene. And the damage caused by them was more than the damage that you would expect from just using the flyers late in the construction season. 
And finally, uh, Indiana right now doesn't have a limit on when you can or cannot use the fly ash. Illinois did that about 10 years before Indiana, even though we have a similar climate. Well, the other area that I was working on uh, and still working on is having to do with another durability, durability problem, and that's the, uh, uh, called the alkali silica reaction. Uh, this is my favorite picture. It comes from Winter Park, uh, where I go skiing every year, uh, or try to. And uh, this is a six mile long tunnel in the Rocky Mountains. And uh, this is uh, the train, ski train actually, coming from Denver and coming to Winter Park. And if you look closely, you can see this block cracking all over the place. And it's a classic example of alkali silica reaction. You can see the tunnel was built between 1923 and 1927, so it's almost 100 years old. So it has the right to deteriorate a little bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> and this is ACI meeting in Kansas City. Robert will probably remember we were in the hotel uh, that was surrounded by the concrete plaza that had all kinds of problems with ASR and, and uh, corrosion of reinforcement. I didn't put it here, but all, there was also some picket line, and we were staying in Hilton, I guess, as the conference was, and the people had big transparencies. Hilton has rats in their hotels. <laughs> I don't know if they were referring to the ACI <laughs> participants or actual rats, but anyway. Uh, I didn't see any, but I see a lot of uh, ASR. And I, I wanted to share with you a little bit about uh, studies that I've done on that. Uh, so alkali reaction is actually a process where you depolymerize and dissolve reactive silica that is part of your aggregate. And that product forms a, a hydrous alkali silica gel the gel attracts the water and swells and exerts the pressure that causes that cracking that I showed you on the portal of the tunnel. There is a general agreement uh, that there is a chemical reaction there is a chemical re that the chemical reaction is necessary to form this gel, but there is not a general agreement on what is the sequence of steps that lead, that lead to formation of this gel. And there is also not general agreement about the mechanism of expansion that causes uh, uh, the pressure that cracks the concrete. So uh, for last six years or so, I've been working on that with uh, several of my students, where we try to look at the process in its entirety, that is, from formation of gel trying to understand the chemical reactions and the kinetics of those reactions that lead to the formation of the gel, and then look at the mechanical response uh, on the micro and macro scale. So this is looking at the macro scale, uh, or micro scale, I should say, uh, and you can see that you have a deposits of gel. You can see there is a calcium silica and oxygen, and you can see the sodium here, and traces of potassium, typical alkalis that are responsible for formation of this gel. And you can see that it causes the cracking of the aggregate, and the crack propagates into the concrete. So it could be a pretty damaging uh, kind of scenario. And there's a series of pictures that, as you go from left to right, uh, we are increasing in age here, and you can see that uh, after some time you start forming those cracks, at the interface between the matrix and the aggregate. You start depositing gel in the pores. If you look at the structures that are really severely affected by that, like dams, for example, where there is a lot of water, there will be this whitish gel uh, oozing out of the pores. Uh, there are some dams in Canada. Canada has a uh, a lot of aggregates that are susceptible to that. And there are some dams in Canada, they grow about five inches a year because of the expansion. So they keep cutting uh, slices of concrete to make sure that it doesn't crack more. So I wonder how long can they cut until they cut 
up to the point that there is nothing left, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, it's not an easily fixable problem. Uh, what one of the tasks that we've done, uh, and, and I think it turned out pretty well, was uh, determining the sequence of the chemical reactions that take place during the ASR. And if you, if you look at this uh, graph very briefly, you can see that this is a, a residual amount of one of those reactive aggregates, crystallites in gram. And you can see that from very beginning, it kind of has a downward tendency, you see, right? You can see that the potassium ions stay more or less steady at the same level. Calcium ions are very low, stay more or less at the same level. But notice that we are decreasing the amount of calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide is plentiful in regular concrete because this is a byproduct of cement hydration. So it's always available. We, we had the system which we were trying to starve out of CaO, uh, well, sorry, calcium hydroxide to see what the role calcium hydroxide plays. And then you can see there's a practically constant level of pH. Uh, if you go and look at what is produced during that phase, uh, we were producing calcium silica hydrate gel, we call it, but this is actually a matrix that bonds the aggregate together in the regular concrete. So, so this is a glue, that's a good stuff, okay? Uh, and when we go to uh, assessing the constants for those reactions, kinetics uh, constants, you can see that they are uh, linear with respect to the amount of the dissolved silica with respect to time in both uh, potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide solution. If we go to uh, further in time uh, to what I called zone two and zone three, something interesting happens. Notice that all of the sudden silica concentration in the pore solution starts picking up. The dissolution of silica practically stops, right? pH changes, and we depleted the amount of calcium hydroxide. Right? So that actually gave us a very good indication of what is happening uh, in that system. We were able to determine that the originally produced calcium silica hydrate gel actually changed to uh, some gel, to form of a gel that contained alkalis and it's more expansive and, and so forth. Uh, so upon further modeling, we determined the, the entire sequence of events in, in this uh, particular situation. So the step one was the formation of CSA gel, then formation of this amorphous alkali loaded gel, uh, then we had continuous increase in concentration of silica ion, and finally uh, we produced the gel uh, in this part, and that's the gel that will be expanding, icarosilica hydrate gel. So those were the observations in the lab. What we wanted to do is to build the model that can actually predict that. So uh, we look at the rate uh, model that uh, involves mass transfer and has all those uh, parameters. It was a pretty complex model, but it worked very well. You can see over here all the data that we collected versus the predicted uh, values that are in the form of the continuous lines there uh, were, were quite good. And those are the modeling results. Those are the results that we got from the experiment that I just showed you, and the general shape of the curves and the location of the phases is very similar. So we said, okay, well, now that we have this tool, what can we do with it? And what, what we uh, propose, and that was a project funded by uh, Federal Higher Administration and, and CHRP, uh, uh, we said, you know, why won't you try to see if we can predict the existence of what's called the uh, threshold alkali concentration. Concentration of alkalis that will not cause ASR. This threshold alkali concentration was about 
0.26, you can see that based on our model prediction, all those curves asymptotically approach that. And uh, that was uh, a good verification that the model actually worked. Uh, we uh, proposed a new test, which we called a new quick chemical test for checking the susceptibility of the aggregate to this degradation process. We came up with some criteria that one can use uh, for that purposes and uh, actually look at about 10 different aggregates that other people determined are reactive and we predicted all of them as uh, being reactive based on somebody else's data. So that also worked uh, relatively good. So th this is sort of a glimpse of what I was doing for, as I said, for the last 20 some years. Uh, now, uh, what my plans for the future are. Uh, so two groups of uh, topics I'm working on right now is one has to do with, sorry, alternatives to traditional cementitious binders. So we're looking at low lime to silica binder that is solidified by carbonation as opposed to hydration. And I recently got involved with uh, Pablo and Jeff Young uh, uh, from material science and some people from other universities on what we call the additive manufacturing on 3D printing. So uh, let's, uh, let me spend a minute or so talking about this carbonation uh, driven type of alternative cementitious material. Uh, the process of carbonation of lime has been known for millennia, right? All the, all the old buildings are built with using a lime mortar that carbonates when exposed to air. In the 80s, uh, people were looking at accelerating of, reg of hydration of leg regular or hardening of regular Portland cement by exposing CO2. But what we are working with, we are working with a startup company in New Jersey called Solidia Technologies that uses non-hydraulic binders that are produced in the same way as the Portland cement is, but at the lower uh, uh, firing temperature. So there's about 30% reduction in CO2 emission because you don't need to uh, uh, decompose so much calcium uh, carbonate. And you use the same material, but lower in calcium carbonate that you use for production of regular Portland cement. And you essentially put the dry cement in, you cover it with film of water, uh, uh, CO2 dissolves in that film of water, and you have sort of a counter diffusion. Uh, uh, CO2 goes in, water goes out, and what you produce is uh, this green stuff, this is calcium carbonate and silica gel as a byproduct. So that actually was very interesting to me because the nature of the silica gel is gel is very much similar to the nature of the silica gel that we see in alkali silica reaction. And we already had some models that uh, deal with that. So I thought it would be an interesting topic to work on. And it's very exciting. Uh, we've done a lot of characterization of those materials using various advanced techniques, including NMR, and uh, try to decipher what kind of product we are forming. Initially, that product had a problem with keeping strength when it got wet. So it was 10,000 when it was dry, 10,000 PSI when it was dry, 4,000 when it was wet. So not very useful, right? Mm -hmm. By looking at the uh, actual type of gel that forms, we were able to advise them on, on changing the way they uh, actually cured the material uh, and the way how they select the size of the particles that go into into the reaction, and they got uh, essentially no strength loss right now. If you look, if I can go back uh, here for a second, notice that there is a pretty large pore in that system uh, that forms, which typically doesn't form in the regular potential system. So the size of the particles that uh, you use uh, needs to be optimized so you have a better packing so you don't have to fill such a big gap as, as you would. Uh, the durability of that new cement is very good. This is a comparison uh, uh, of specimens from Portland cement that were exposed to sodium sulfate solution, something that you may expect in a 
in Nevada or California where the groundwater has the sulfates in it, and this is uh, this, this cement that performed very well. Uh, you know, we've done a lot of investigation of uh, the actual uh, reaction products and, uh, and develop a pretty good idea for the model that is currently being tested with respect to the optimizing the uh, curing conditions uh, to solidify this material. And finally, uh, this is a newest adventure. Uh, uh, we just got the collaborative NSF project funded. Uh, it's a, a joint venture between Purdue, Tennessee Tech, and Vanderbilt, where we are looking at 3D printing as a tool for uh, development of multi-scale hierarchical uh, microstructure of cement-based material. The idea is that you know, if you could put a components that are of importance, let's say fibers that can carry the tensile load or something like, something like that, just in the place where you actually need them, rather than putting them everywhere, you will engineer the microstructure that does exactly what you want. It's not an easy problem uh, uh, because you need to worry about placing the material in the right spot. You need to worry about the interfaces between whatever components you use. And pretty much the only way you can do it with high enough precision is to print it in place. Uh, so uh, we are looking at the development of the prototype equipment for that purpose, looking at the uh, processing conditions, formulation of the printing media, and ultimately uh, we'll look into modeling, that's fabulous part, uh, of, uh, of the performance of the material that we hope to produce. So this is all I have. Uh, I wanted to officially thank uh, all my students uh, that helped with all this work all the collaborators uh, uh, that I had over the years, uh, all the sponsors who made all this possible, my wife who is over there very supportive. Uh, she doesn't want to be put on the spot, I am sure, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, her enduring support uh, that helped with that. Uh, with this, uh, I will finish, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Right. Come on, we, we must have some questions. <laughs> Me? Any, oh, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> anyone. anyone. Luna came with the notebooks. I'm sure she has a question. Yeah, I have so many notebooks. Yeah, yeah, so, okay. Uh, yeah, I do have, I, I wouldn't say with really uh, questions. I, I just uh, hope to get some of your comments. Because I think you have done, you know, excellent research and give a very good example about how to do high impact research, combine a fundamental science and then engineering application. Um, so, what do you think about uh, the nanotechnology in the cement or the concrete, and uh, you know, for the for the direction wise? Well, so uh, nanotechnology uh, has been this hot topic for the la last ten years. Okay, in, in cement and concrete. And everybody was trying to uh, use it uh, initially. I think people didn't really approach it correctly. Uh, so it took a little bit of a setback, in my opinion. <clears throat> the reason people didn't approach it correctly is because it was so, such a hot topic in all the other fields that people say, okay, let's throw something nano in concrete and see what it does, right? And really not approaching it from, from the fundamental uh, type of perspective. I think uh, people who try that very quickly realize that it's just too expensive mm -hmm. and the payout is just not there. But there are other people now who are trying to approach it a bit more pragmatically, uh, looking at the uh, science behind it. I think with the proper fundamental research that could be uh, at, you know, it might be a niche type of material, but it's going. But I think it could be quite unique, considering the versatility of concrete and the 
a large amount of concrete that is being used. Uh, anything from you know, sensing to energy harvesting. Uh, you know, we, we actually uh, look, uh, I'm looking at Becky, you know, we had a proposal uh, for the center uh, that was uh, focusing on charging the electrical cars on the fly as they drive over the uh, highway. Mm -hmm. And I was secretly hoping that we can put some of the nano uh, <laughs> materials there for energy harvesting yeah. purposes. Unfortunately, we didn't get the funding, but uh, the, 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 the core group of people who started it are kind of working on it still. Maybe we'll go and try it another round. Uh, I think that part of the reason we didn't get funded is that uh, we hit the cheap gasoline, mm -hmm. uh, who cares about the electrical car, yeah. of <laughs> uh, you know, mentality. But so I'm waiting for the oil crisis to <laughs> <laughs> to check up our chances. <laughs> yes. So yeah. So you, uh, in, in your presentation, you talk about you know the problems that are generated into these materials and basically you know identify those and how we we design new materials such that. So what are all your thoughts on you know what the problems that we really have, right? You know you showed. Uh, Example of iteration, or what are your thoughts on how we can fix those, or where the research should go to fix what we have rather than, uh, or in addition to uh, designing new materials? Yeah, so, the, the research in the area of <coughs> uh, maintenance and rehabilitation uh, it really is focusing on uh, cladding materials. Uh, rapid setting materials. I think the field of rapid setting materials in particular uh, has a lot of potential. Uh, the reason for that is that, again, right now the way it's handled, there are proprietary producers of those rapid setting materials that will promise you anything. Uh, that, uh, and then when it actually comes to application, it really doesn't work, or only works for a very short time. And part of the reason for that is that uh, there is a too big of an incompatibility between the properties of this new material that forms in situ and the existing material. We, we are not trying to remove the underlying causes, uh, be the elevated level of chlorides or be being microcracking or something like that. So I think anything that will combine, uh, it's not a self-healing, but some sort of a healing of the existing structure to the point that is more compatible with those new materials would be a great field to go into. Problem is that I'm not sure who will fund that. But <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, so a, a cubic meter of this new concrete sequesters about 300 kilos of CO2. Ideally, uh, we are not there yet. Ideally, what one can do is build a ready mix plant and build the uh, some sort of the uh, concrete plant right next to the cement plant and take the CO2 that escapes from, from the chimney right now and use it for uh, curing that material in situ. Uh, we are working on the potential for carbonating uh, in the field right now, uh, but really the immediate application, and that's what that company is actually doing. It has licenses already with quite a few uh, precast concrete manufacturers, is to use that CO2 in the precast concrete plant, where you can build the tent around and create the right conditions. Uh, the purity of CO2 is an issue. 
And right now, since we don't have really a carbon tax in this country, the producers of CO2 are not motivated to clean it. And the way it comes out uh, is really not suitable for it. the effectiveness in carbonation wouldn't be high enough. So uh, this particular company buys a CO2 from the producer that cleans it uh, before uh, releasing it, and it's a metal, uh, metal producing business. Uh, but ultimately, if, if the economy is right, uh, there will be an incentive perhaps to, to clean that CO2 and, uh, and be a little bit more uh, efficient in using what we produce. Uh, Europeans have the carbon tax, and uh, you know the the climate uh, conference in Kyoto that was what eight ten years ago. Uh, uh, U.S. did not sign the newest uh, treaty. I am not sure. I think they did sign, but it will probably take a few years before it percolates down to the executive level, right? go back to the beginning a little bit with fly ash. Uh -huh. So obviously we all know now the great benefits of it. In fact, some are using 50, 60 cent percent replacement. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> but now going back to the CO2 issue, coal was dropped dramatically. Actually, I think in the US right now, it went from 65%, it's below 35% of all energy is being mm -hmm. done by coal. So there's now huge shortages of fly ash. I'm, I was just in New York. They can't get fly ash at all right now. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do to replace fly ash? Because, I mean, it's a valuable tool in what we can do for durability and strength. Well, I think that there are two things we can do. One, uh, uh, maybe, maybe the most obvious, is that there are tons and tons of stockpiled fly ash uh, that uh, probably will provide supply at the current level for the next 30 years, if we wanted to touch them. Uh, there were laying uh, uh, in various deposits long enough that uh, there is a worry about heavy metals that will settle at the bottom. Uh, uh, the, uh, there is worry about cost of drying them because they are very often in the ponds. Uh, there, is, uh, there is worry about some of those early uh, ponded fly ashes having too high of a carbon content to be useful, so there will be a cost associated with processing. But Considering the benefit of that material, uh, I think when, again, when the prices are right, that will happen, and we'll try to reclaim what we stored uh, over the years. Uh, the, the second approach, and there are people who are actually very proactive in that, is the production of the artificial puzzlons. Uh, again, you can do that from the same materials that you use for production of cement at much lower temperature. And uh, in fact, the company that we work with on this um, uh, Solidia Cement, they are already filing for patent for producing artificial pozzolana, which would be actually a byproduct of their uh, carbon-friendly cement production. So, so, so I think people realize the benefits of having something that consumes this extra calcium hydroxide in, cement, in, in concrete and whether it's the artificial, natural, or, or uh, reclaimed, they will try to use it. Any other questions? Well, hearing none, I'd like to again thank uh, Jan for a great presentation. Thank you. <laughs>